Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning's study. Now, uh, normally Dwight would be here, but uh, his uh, mom's in the hospital and he had to stay. He said he was going to stay probably mostly overnight. So obviously they need our prayers in his mom. So I'm going to be doing two presentations. But before we begin, uh, can you join me in a word of prayer? A dear father in heaven. We are so grateful for the Sabbath and for the fellowship that we have through your spirit and um, that we can communicate with people around the world and that you can teach us. Um, we pray for Dwight and his mom. We ask for your healing hand to be upon her and that you can help uh, Dwight in uh, the trials that he faces. We know, Lord, that there is a purpose in all things. Some things are extremely painful and difficult to go through, but we know, Lord, that you are always there. We ask that you can be here now as we open your word together. And as we look at uh, the history of how you have worked in the past and what it shows for what you want to do in our lives today. So we invite your spirit to speak to our hearts and those that are watching these videos that they can be um, encouraged, strengthened, comforted, and instructed, and that we can be corrected of all errors we may have in our understanding, and that we can glorify your name. Thank you again for the Sabbath and the precious time that we spend with you and with each other, and we pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. So we last week in our symbolic use of numbers, we were looking at the relationship between the prophecy of Revelation 9, verse 15, specifically the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, a day, a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And we know that this is it's under the sixth trumpet and it's going to be the second woe. Now, I want to look at a couple of things. So, I mean, the purpose of these studies here is the understanding of the symbolic use of numbers. That's what this series is entitled. And we're looking back at how we understood things in the past and how these symbols developed, how we came to understand how to apply these symbols. Now, we know that um, in Revelation 9, that Josiah Litch used this prophecy to predict the the fall of the Ottoman Empire. And it's it's not something that's well accepted in Adventism today. Now, obviously, there are those who believe in the Bible and spirit of prophecy who take Ellen White's statement regarding Josiah Litch's prediction that it was a fulfillment of prophecy. And to them, that's good enough. Uh, there are others who uh, don't accept Ellen White's statement. So they don't take it as a fulfillment of prophecy. They, they take her statement, and, and I'm going to read the statement here. This is in, okay, well, for some reason, I, I found this quote. I didn't find the one I was looking for, so why not? Well, this one this one is basically the quote, uh, but it's just in um, Maranatha. But, but it's, it's also in the Great Controversy, but I'll show you this here. So this is... The Ottoman Empire and Prophecy, May 24th, in the book Maranatha. Right, so that's where the reference is. And this is the verse that we, we've been looking at. Um, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, day, and a month and a year, for to slay the third part of men. Revelation 9, verse 14 and 15. The history of nations that one after another have occupied their allotted time and place, unconsciously witnessing to the truth of which they themselves knew not the meaning, speaks to us. To every nation and to every individual of today, God has assigned a place in his great plan. And we have to keep that in mind that, that this isn't just about nations, all of this stuff that we do with chronology that it reaches down to our individual lives, to the events that occur in our lives. And we're going to look at some of these things, some of these things in my life personally, as they relate to the lines that occur within this movement. 
and to understand why God does it this way. I did a study, I do study Friday morning, every second Friday, I guess, uh, with a brother from Vietnam. And, and usually those studies I don't post on my YouTube page. Uh, one is because, you know, I'm addressing his questions, which probably other people would benefit from. But also I end up talking about a lot of personal things that um, I wouldn't generally post on on YouTube because he asked me lots of personal questions, you know, things about my life and so forth. So I generally wouldn't post those on YouTube. But um, we did a study yesterday morning and, and it was very interesting. And so some of those things I'm going to share here this morning. But the idea that there is that God has assigned to every nation and to every individual of today, God has designed a, a place in his great plan. And so God has a place for you and I in his plan. And, and we talked uh, yesterday about organization and about the body of Christ. Now, we're all connected to the head. The head is the thing that guides and directs the parts of the body. But often parts of the body, at least in, in an unhealthy body, seek to, to have a higher honor or place than they should and criticize other parts of the body. And so the bar, body is in a schism. Your body's in a schism. It's not uh, a healthful thing. You know, it's what we would call disease. So if you have your immune system attacking uh, your body, that would be uh, the body in a schism. So we know that God has a purpose and a place. And for us as individuals, uh, to understand how God leads us as individuals is extremely important. Uh, that that he, he leads us not with us knowing all of the steps of our lives and every significance of what's going to happen. He leads us on step by step. His, his word is a light to our feet, right? A lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. And as we walk with God, he gives us uh, guidance and direction. And we have things along the way that we can be sure that he is leading us, that we're on the right path. So it doesn't mean that we know everything or we know the end of what those things are, uh, but we have to faithfully do the things that God asks us to do. And, and so the choice is whether it's of a nation, whether it's of an individual, the, these choices that we make on, on a day to day basis are what determine our destiny. And now this next part is interesting as well. Today, men and nations are being measured by the plummet in the hand of him who makes no mistake. Now we know the line and the plummet go together. So the line is a line of judgment and the plummet, uh, that's, that's a way mark. That's as righteousness. And that's from precept upon precept, line upon line in uh, Isaiah 28, right? So we're, we're familiar with that. I'm just going to quickly go to uh, the verse judgment. That's 28 verse 17. So that has all the digits of July 18, 2020. If you go backwards, it's July 18, 2, right? If that makes sense. Uh, Isaiah 28, 17. Judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies. And the water shall overflow the hiding place. So um, and the hail, of course, represents uh, the coming of Christ, it's the seventh plague, and the waters uh, represent judgment in this case. Waters can represent people, but they can also represent judgment because they can be uh, nations that come in. They can be represented as water, and the overflowing represents uh, the Sunday law. So, so we know in putting things on a line, line upon line, uh, we have the line itself, which is uh, this line of judgment. That's what a line is. It's it's showing God's work. And judgment isn't always just a, ne a negative thing because it's, it's judgment is connected to justice and restoration. And then the righteousness, these are the way marks. So if we think about this, today men and nations are being measured by the plummet in the hand of him who makes no mistake. So these way marks are... are are measurements, right? That That is, it's a plummet. And seeing if things are vertical, if they're, they stand up straight. So people are being tested by these events that occur in history, in this line of judgment, when a message is given, 
It produces a line. All are by their own choice deciding their destiny. So your de destiny is not decided by the events outside of you. You know, they're not, they're not determined by fate, but they're determined by your choice. And that choice is given you by God. Without God, there is no free will. Uh, it was kind of interesting on, on Thursday evening, I have this guitar student who's quite a talented uh, guitar student. Uh, he's uh, from Quebec, I think from Montreal. But um, we always end up having a, a discussion after his lesson about things, all kinds of things. Uh, he, he just always seems so fascinated by the, the stories I share about my life and so forth. And, uh, you know, his lesson ends at uh, 6.30. Uh, on Thursday, he left at 20 after 9, so nearly three hours of us talking about things and, and we talk a lot about religion. So he's quite interested in uh, the chronology that I talk about and some of the research that I've done. You know, we had a little bit of a discussion about free will, right? You know, because he says, well, all these things, you know, like God knows all these things in advance. You know, what does that say about our free will? And the fact that God knows the end from the beginning does not take away our free will. Uh, we, we have made a choice. God, God sits outside of time and he knows what's going to happen. Uh, but God has given us free choice. The, the ability to choose is something that I, I believe it, it, it just couldn't exist without God. Otherwise, we would just be automatons. We'd just be the product of chance and nature and so forth if there was no God. So anyway, it, we have our own choice deciding our destiny. But God is, is overruling all for the accomplishment of his purposes. Now, these can seem almost contradictory. So we have this free choice, yet God overrules. So in what way does God overrule our free choice? So God doesn't take away our free choice. He's, he's actually given it to us. But he is, he's overruling all for the accomplishment of his purposes. And so, you know, this can seem contradictory. But the way that I understand that he does it is because God has declared the end from the beginning, because God has given prophecy, his word is powerful and it can direct. So when God promises something's going to happen, it doesn't take away the, the individual's choice, but it means that that there is some power that God has that we, we can't understand, that even when people have free choice, he can determine the future, that his purposes will be worked out because his word is powerful. And as people believe his word, that word accomplishes a work. Now, Ellen White then uh, talks about prophecy, right? So that's what you know, and, and whether this is all from one uh, statement or whether it's uh, I'm not sure where this originally comes from. All that prophecy has foretold as coming to pass until the present time has been traced on the pages of history. And we may be assured that all which is yet to come will be fulfilled in its order. Now, um, this idea that things have this order, that these events are on a line of judgment and that that their way marks are measured by a plummet. This is what this movement is about. It's understanding this principle that the events of the past are being repeated. And, and prophecy has foretold things that came to pass. And, and we can see this in the books of history. And, and this gives us an assurance that God can determine everything that is still going to happen. Now, she then moves to this prophecy in particular. In the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest. Two years before, Josiah Litch, one of the leading ministers preaching the Second Advent, published an exposition of Revelation 9, predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. According to his calculations, this power was to be overthrown in AD 1840, sometime in the month of August. And only a few days previous to its accomplishment, he wrote, allowing the first period, 150 years, to have been exactly fulfilled before Diakosis. Now, it should actually be Dracosis, but the book he had had a typo in it. Um, and that typo has persisted. So I'm just quoting him. She's not correcting it. 
but it's actually Jokosi's. That's um, Constantine the Eleventh. Uh, so when he uh, ascended to the throne by permission of the Turks, and that the 300 and fi- 391 years, 15 days, commenced at the close of the first period, it will end on August 11th, 1840, when the Ottoman power in Constantinople Constantinople may be expected to be broken. This, I believe, will be found to be the case. And this is what what happened. At the very time specified, Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of Christian nations. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. A wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement. So we say that this is the empowerment of the first angel's message. That's the name of this is. Now, this is criticized within Adventism, and of course, I've written lots about it, why these criticisms are faulty. In some of the criticisms, they can be found in, uh, uh, which I address. I address them in this paper. And, and I've, I've never really go, gone into detail in, in this in presentations. Um, it, you know, I, I've addressed it in papers a bit. And some of the stuff, there's a lot of detail. For instance, the date that he starts with, July 27th, 1299, for the first woe. If you look at Wikipedia, they're going to say it's July 27th, uh, 1301, right? So there are, sometimes you'll see dates of 1302. And um, there is a Adventist scholar, um, i trying to think of his name. Um, I can't think of his name right now. But but he does some research to show definitively that it is uh, July 27th, 1299, that we have the beginning of the Ottoman Empire. Now, the Ottoman Empire, Turkey, recognize, recognizes that date, July 27th, 1299. But so there's a lot of details that need to be understood where there is these attacks against Josiah Lich's interpretation of this prophecy. And um, so... So many Adventists, because they don't, they don't have the resources necessary and they trust the sources that they do have, Adventist scholarship, uh, people like Heidi Hikes, you know, has written a, a book called uh, Satan's Counterfeit Prophecy, addressing the prophecy of Revelation chapter nine and Josiah Lich's interpretation. I would have a really hard time but he tries to do it, to take Ellen Whiteman's statement here, this remarkable fil- fulfillment of prophecy as being a satanic counterfeit prophecy, as Heidi Hikes tries to uh, prove. But his arguments uh, are faulty, obviously. Now, i um, just going to bring up this paper here. So again, I'm trying to take my time here, not just because I have two hours today to do this, but... I really want people to to take the time to think about these things. Normally, I tend to present things a little too rapidly. So in this uh, paper of mine called Josiah Lich's Prophecy, and this is my revision of it, I'm going to address some of these things dealing with uh, Uriah Smith's, Smith's and Heidi Hike's Satan's Counterfeit Prophecy book. So I address those things. So there's that very statement again in the year. Very Sorry, Theodore. Could you very briefly explain why Heitz doesn't accept accept the twenty five twenty? Why he thinks it's it's a counterfeit, a satanic counterfeit, uh, counterfeit at that? The twenty five twenty is not dealing with the twenty five twenty. He's dealing with Josiah Lich's prophecy. Uh, I don't know why Heid, what Heidi. I mean, I'm sure he doesn't accept the twenty five twenty, but I don't know that he writes about it. But he does write about. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I thought it was dealing with the 2520. Sorry. No. Nope. Nope. So this is dealing with Revelation chapter 9. So this is the prophecy that ends in 1840, right? August 11th, 1840. Now, so Adventism has uh, rejected this interpretation of Revelation 9 uh, gradually. And that is, we know that August 11th, 1840 is the fulfillment of prophecy. But it's not truly the end of the Ottoman Empire. That is, you're not going to see that until, you know, the 1920s when there's no more Turkish sultan. The last Turkish sultan resigns. And so 
So the abolishment of the Sultanate is what people would look at as the end of the Ottoman Empire. Yet, that's not really what the prophecy is predicting in the way that people understand it. It's predicting uh, when Turkey becomes under the control of the Christian nations. And that's going to happen when the ultimatum is delivered on August 11th, 1840. So part of the problem is that people don't understand the prophecy itself and how prophecy is fulfilled. So we have, uh, what's the other example of, I'm trying to think of it, it's just escaping my mind right now. But lots of times people will look at, well, for instance, the 1260. You know, there isn't 1260 years of papal persecution. You know, the persecution maybe lasted 300 years. People have this type of criticism. Or, you know, why 538 or 508, you know, for the start of these various periods, that you could use different different dates you know eastern western rome fell in in 476 why wouldn't you use that as the start uh you know all different kinds of arguments like that um and especially when it comes to chronology and dates people will often find some alternative date that somebody has for some event so you know they'll have artaxerxes decree must have happened in 458 not 457 you know, not fully understanding um, all of the arguments for it. Uh, Or, you know, Jesus couldn't have been crucified in 31 AD or, you know, October 22nd, 1844 couldn't have been the Day of Atonement, things like that. So people will have all kinds of arguments. But one of the things that, uh, one of the principles that, that we use when we study to find out the truth is you take all of the information and consider all of it. And we, we base our understanding up, upon the preponderance of the evidence. We don't pick or choose things that we like to prove some belief that we have. We use an objective approach. There's a typo in my paper. Begin. Anyway, so when I began my, my protest, my protest, <laughs> my process, of studying chronology uh, in relationship to the 2520, for instance, I wasn't trying to prove that the 2520 was correct. I was trying to see whether it was correct. I was trying to see, is there evidence for this? It makes sense, but if there's no evidence for it, then there's no reason for me to believe it. But often people approach things to prove, either to prove something wrong, Right. So they would look for evidence that 677 was not when Manessa was taken captive. And if they find what they call evidence to show that he couldn't have been taken captive in 677, to them that settles the matter. All other evidence to the contrary is going to be ignored. And, and people do this in all kinds of things that they study. And, and we can't do that. We need to look at all of the evidence and say, what does all of the evidence say? We bring all the scriptures together. Now, when it comes to, of course, historical evidence, uh, chronological, uh, um, archaeological evidence, we know that the Bible is true. And so that all of the evidence needs to align to the Bible and that the Bible has to. We we can't have, for instance, things like the 65 year prophecy of Isaiah chapter seven. And I will just ask people a simple question. Okay, when is the 65 year prophecy? You know, if you don't believe the 2520 and you don't believe, you know, 742 and, and all these different things, when, when is this prophecy fulfilled? And, and they will just say, well, I don't know. It, it, it's, you know, it doesn't matter. It's not important. It's not a major prophecy. Why is it there in the Bible within 65 years? Why is it given as an evidence? I mean, you have to have an explanation for it or Ezekiel's 390 years and 40 years. You know, if you have no explanation for it, how can you criticize it? You know, Revelation 8 and 9, if, if you don't have a fulfillment for it in the past, and you, so people want to put it in the future, the trumpets into the future. I mean, that's really where, why they reject Ellen White's uh, view. But there are some people who believe, you know, parts of these things, you know, they, they, they sort of are founded. Well, these are prophecies. They, they deal with Islam. They might accept that. 
but they'll just say that Josiah was wrong. There must, must be some other way to understand this. I don't know. I, I don't understand why this is such a difficult problem, because it is very clear that Ellen White says this is a fulfillment of prophecy. So, so anyway, in the, in this paper, I address, uh, some of these criticisms, um, of, of this. And I go through, uh, you know, the trumpets themselves. I've shown you this paper before. And there's some maps, which I borrowed from someone. I didn't make those maps. And then when we get to, uh, the five months, one of the things that I discovered is that there are two periods of five months. There's 250 year periods. So that was something that, that I discovered when I studied this. Now there's also things about five months itself. This is the period of the time in which uh, the locusts uh, occur. So, so it's a symbol that relates to locusts that locusts represent Islam. And, uh, so there's this period of 150 years. Uh, that ends in 782 with the Treaty of Constantinople, and I document that. And then uh, I show these these uh, uh, this period 632. That's Abu Bakr's command to 782. That's 150 years. And then there's a period of 126 years and 391 years to July 27th, 1299. Now the interesting thing about that is and we did look at this before but in our going from june 9th to october 13th there was 126 days and that's followed by 391 and a half days to go to november 9th so you can see that 126 and the 391 ended up in my study back in 2015 when i studied revelation 9. so and that's because of those two periods of 150 years. So, so these symbols that, that occurred in prophecies that I had been studying that had nothing to do with our timeline or, you know, date setting or anything like that, the chronology of this movement ended up as being a part of the chronology of this movement, which, which I just find fascinating that that occurred. It wasn't something that, uh, you know, anybody so, and, and that's one of the things I'm trying to show in going over this is that we didn't, um, we didn't start with this 126 years and 391 or 126 days and 391 days in our history and then tried to force something in the Bible to fit to that, right? We studied Bible prophecy first and that Bible prophecy, all of these patterns and structures and dates ended up showing up in our history. So that was an important point, that if people could see how these things unfolded, how we came to understand certain truths, then they, they, they would get a better picture of, of what we're doing. But often they just know, you know, our conclusions without understanding the process of how we, we came to those conclusions and how God unfolded these things step by step. Now, um, this part here, an hour, a day, and a month, and a year, so we know this is 391 years and 15 days. And, um, and I've did, done some study on this already in other studies, but, uh, I'm going to just give here something that Heidi Hike says. So, um, Heidi Hike sums up in a strong rhetorical manner the position of Josiah Litch and the pioneers quite well, in spite of his objections to their interpretation of Revelation chapter nine. So here's what Heidi Hike says about this. The prophetic 391 plus 15 day years, day years, claimed for the sixth trumpet had to commence on July 27th, 1449 as well, in order to precisely fulfill the total span allotted to the prophecy of 541 years and 15 days. That is, if you add the 391 to the 150, you get 541 years. And Josiah Litch begins it at July 27th, 1299, the 541 years. And then he adds the 15 days that leads him from July 27th, 1840 to August 11th, 1840. Um, and he says, Heidi Hike says, that is because William Miller, Josiah Litch, and the Millerites combined the two claimed prophetic time periods together as one continuous whole. This, they de this then demanded that the prophecy be terminated, not only in the year eight of 1840, 
but also in the very day of August 11th, as Ellen White recounted of the Millerites' belief and teaching at the time. Unfortunately, Josiah Litch overlooked one very important point in his calculation of the prophetic periods, as you all know. The Gregorian calendar of Pope Gregory XIII replaced the Julian calendar by a papal bull signed into effect on February 24th, 1582. When introduced, it immediately omitted 10 days in order to realign the calendar with the spring equinox, which was tied by the Roman Catholic Church to the celebration of Easter. The Millerites failed to take this 10-day discrepancy into account when they fixed the date for the termination of the Sixth Trumpet on August 11, 1840. Many Seventh-day Adventists today do not remember or know that their history has been falsely colored with numerous apologies and adjustments until Josiah Litch's prophecy has become almost unrecognizable to the historian. It's almost as if we Adventists have picked and chosen what we want to keep and have disposed of what we don't. And that is exactly what Treye blatantly does today. So he's actually responding to Dr. Alberto uh, Treye, and, and that's the guy's name, Treye, or however you say his name. That's what exactly Treye does, blatantly does today, and it is all presented as fully supportive of the historical position. Incredible. So Heidi, Heidi, Heidi Hike's response. Now, now, when you read uh, and, and you study into this in depth, Heidi Hikes is really just when when somebody has incredulity here, right? Uh, this is an argument by incredulity. I can't believe that he actually believes that. I, you know, the thing is, the evidence shows this, but Heidi Hikes isn't willing to look at the evidence or hasn't looked at the evidence, and and we know that it, it isn't as simple as just adjusting for the Gregorian calendar, right? So remember when we looked at this in the past, so here we have, well, I use the Jewish Karaite calendar, but I'm actually, it's it's the biblical calendar. I don't use the Karaite calendar. So we, we look here at July 27th, 1299. We can see that it's the 26th day of the fourth month, Tammuz, and then the 26th day of the fourth month in 1840. And, and what you see here is you see the, the Julian on the bottom and the biblical on the top. And you can see how July 27th Gregorian lines up with July 27th Julian. So obviously if he had adjusted that and he had taken uh, the Gregorian date in 18 or in 1299, it would have been August 3rd. And so he would have been off. But the biblical date lines up, right? And so we've looked at that. Now, Hikes isn't looking for that. All he's looking for is some way to tear down what Adventists believe on this point, even though he's an Adventist. So I write, you know, Hike uses further rhetoric in referring to what he calls numerous apologies and adjustments. And this could be said of all the teachings of Adventism in that we were given more light in our understanding of these prophecies after the disappointment. Also, many who are trying to support the pioneer position have been influenced by the errors of prophetic and scriptural interpretation that is used in the Protestant churches. As we have looked closely into the pioneer understanding of the trumpets, we find that there is much less that needs to be adjusted from the original understanding than many suppose. Obviously, there were a few things that the Millerites could not have understood since they were looking for Christ coming so soon. For instance, the Millerites believed that the sixth trumpet ended on August 11th, 1840, and that the events of the seventh trumpet were to occur in the intervening period uh, to the second coming in 1843. Obviously, as to this point, they were wrong. We understand that the seventh trumpet began to sound October 22nd, 1844, right? So obviously there are things that Adventists didn't fully understand, but often in trying to correct what people see as errors, we end up with this weakening of the truth because people are trying to align this to some, you know, Protestant understanding, right? And that's, Hikes is actually the one who's really uh, making numerous apologies and adjustments. I mean, and, and we can see the parallel to this in something like July 18, 2020. Things don't happen the way that we expect. We go back and we try to reinterpret things instead of trying to understand them. Now, um, 
So I, I think it's important, and if anybody has questions or comments on this, uh, you know, feel free to, to make those comments. But when we look at this, this prophecy of, I'm going to go back to Revelation 9. So this hour, a day, and a month, and a year. So I've, I've already addressed this before. Now we know that if we take a day, a prophetic day, that's one year, and, in, and a prophetic month is 30 years, and a prophetic year is 360 years, we get 391 years. Now this, this length of time, that is used, uh, we, we did the study on it. I'm just going to bring it back here again. Um, this is what we looked at last time. And we're going to try to address some more regarding this. Is this 391 years, which is 142,810 days, right? It's now, it's actually 391 years and if we divided it into 12, that is, if we, we looked at 391 months, 391 months is, is one twelfth of 391 years, right? Obviously. And that each one of those periods is 11,900 days. Actually, more specifically, it's 11,900 days and 1190 minutes, right? So that is, if you, you, you take each of these periods, which I just put 11,900, I wasn't going to put all the decimals there. And each one of these is a cycle that relates to the Islamic calendar. So that symbol that, that addresses uh, Islam, we know that it's, it's going to be in Revelation 9, uh, 11. They had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek name hath, in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon, right? And, and we know that that relates to, uh, to Othman. Because normally locusts don't have a king over them. There is a Bible verse. So okay, let's go here. Take my time. So we know that there's, that the idea that these are locusts, right? And they have tails like scorpions, and, and there's all this description of them. Here, I'm going to just go back here. So this is the first woe. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven onto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So this refers to Muhammad in this symbol. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth neither any green thing neither any tree but in only those men which not have not the seal of god on their foreheads so this is abu, Be abu Bakr's command so this is going to be in 632 a.d that we have abu, abu Bakr's command it's at the death of muhammad right and to them it was given that they should not kill them but that they should be tormented five months. So that's going to end in 782 uh, with uh, the Treaty of Constantinople. And their torment was as the torment of the scorpion when it striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto the horses prepared unto battle and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had the hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was the sound of chariots and many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. So this is the second period of five months, or 150 years, that we, we typically look at. And this is going to begin October or not October, July 27th, uh, 1299, right? And it says they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. And then, so that's in 911. So we're going to have 911, that verse is going to refer to Othman. Now, the verse is... It's Proverbs 30, verse 27. So we can see there, there's a symbol of the message to the Levites. The locusts have no king, 
yet they go forth, all of them by bands. So the idea about a locust is it doesn't have a king. But in Revelation chapter 9, these locusts are going to have a king. And that's going to be Othman, right? So that's going to be where we um, mark that period of five months. It's going to be the rise of Othman. And it's going to be referred to as the woe, right? The first woe. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter, right? Then the sixth angel sounds. And what we're going to see here is these, these symbols, which we don't generally address when we study this. But it's it says... Uh, I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. So this is the altar of incense. Uh, so I'm going to ask the question, why is the altar of incense, why is it being mentioned here in Revelation 9, 13? Well, the Day of Atonement is, is uh, preparing for the Day of Atonement, preparing for it. Oh, okay. So so we know that the trumpets the, the trumpets are introducing an announcement of the Day of Atonement. Right. That's that's the idea of a trumpet. It's, the trumpets are being symbolized by the Feast of Trumpets. Yeah. Rosh Hashanah. Right. So so we're going to have here um, when we go back to uh, verse chapter eight and we have the seventh seal open. That's the end of the seals. Right. And then you're going to see an eight verse two. So. For some reason, I I don't know why they didn't put 8 verse 1 as the end of chapter 7, and 8 verse 2 as the beginning of chapter 8, but this is just the way they put the verse. And um, so I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. So that's the altar of incense. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints, of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne and the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. The angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. So there's some symbols here that address God's judgment. Now we know that the trumpets, the first four trumpets are going to be judgments upon Western Rome. Right, because we're studying that in Daniel chapter 11. Now, what some people try to look at this and, and why they want to put these trumpets into the future is they think that this is the close of probation. That, that that's what's happening with this censor being cast down, and that that when the censor is cast down, that's going to be the close of probation, and then they take the similarities between the trumpets and the plagues, and then they say, well, the trumpets are still future. And those are just uh, the same period of time as the plagues. This this is a, the view that you will generally see within Adventism, some kind of idea that the trumpets are future. And so the historical application of the trumpets, they reject. Right. So they and, and that's the main basis for doing so is is taking that that symbolism. So we can see when the trumpets are set up, we see a scene in heaven. Now, the thing is, we see scenes in heaven in in chapter one, which leads then to the messages to the seven churches. And then we see a scene in in Revelation chapter four and five, which give this set up. It sets up the scenes for the seven seals. And then in Revelation chapter eight, verse two, uh, we see this other scene in heaven. Now, in the first scene, we see Christ standing in the midst of the candlesticks. In chapter one, in chapter four and five, Christ is uh, seated upon a throne with a rainbow above his head. He's that's Christ's throne. That's in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And this also is in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. That is the gold, the, the golden altar, which is before the throne, is in the holy place. Right. It's not in the most holy place. Now, it pertains to the most holy place. And and so some people try to say, well, no, this is actually Christ ministering in the most holy place with the with with um, uh, the altar of incense. But it says he stood at the altar having the golden censer and the altar itself is in the holy place, not in the most holy place. Now, we're going to get the most holy place when we see the temple of God open and we can see the Ark of the Testament. So that's going to be uh, 
So we see this progression of moving through the sanctuary, so to speak. And then we start in the holy place. Uh, we also have in chapter four and five um, uh, symbols that would relate to uh, the altar of a burnt offering as well. So there's going to be um, in that. So we, we see all of these, this furniture of the sanctuary uh, progressively through the book of Revelation. Right. And, and that's often missed by people who don't understand the sanctuary message. You know, other Christians, uh, they're going to take this sometimes as, you know, like a literal temple that's going to be built in the future. There's all kinds of really strange things that they have um, that Christians have in interpreting Revelation. But we can understand them as symbols representing Christ as our high priest. So this is in preparation for uh, the Day of Atonement, which hasn't happened here yet. So these, this prophecy is not addressing something after the close of probation. Uh, so that's sort of the way that I would understand it. So then we're going to have the first four trumpets addressing the fall of Western Rome. And then we get the fifth and sixth trumpet that are going to specifically address the fall of Eastern Rome. So we can look at this historically, and there's lots of different Protestant commentators from the past who understood this as referring to Islam. Uh, they might have different views about exactly where to mark the five months. And and, and many just mark the five months from uh, um, from uh, which 632 to 782. But they don't mark the other period of five months with Othman. And of course, you would need to do that because Othman is going to be mentioned, not by name, but as the symbol of the one who is the king over them. Hopefully that explanation is clear enough. So we now we have this, uh, we, we have then, um, uh, what's the other question here? Oh, okay. In, in nine verse 14. So we, we answered verse 13, the idea of the horns of the golden altar. So that means he's at the altar of incense. And that's where the sixth angel is going to, to sound. There's going to be a voice heard from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Now, we know that the river Euphrates is relating to Babylon, right? We know that when Babylon falls, the river Euphrates was dried up, and we had the armies of Cyrus go in into the city and go through the two leaved gates, within the city uh, to overthrow Babylon. Now there's a question. Uh, no, I don't think it does. Just the question Angela asks. I don't think it has anything to do with it, but I'm not going to go into that right now. Okay, so we have this river Euphrates. So the, the river Euphrates relating to literal Babylon relates to spiritual Babylon. And there are four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And these four angels, of course, are messages from God. And, and these are prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year to slay the third part of men. Now, why, what, if we think about the fall of Babylon and we think about these, the river Euphrates, this is obviously dealing with, with Rome, not with Babylon itself. Okay. And especially when you think about, uh, uh, Eastern Rome, which this is going to be, that's going to fall, we can see why the Euphrates is attached to that. Now, we're also going to see Euphrates mentioned in the plagues, right? So this is one of the, the connections that people have. They say, well, the sixth plague is the drying up of the great river Euphrates, and the sixth trumpet, there are four angels that are loosed, from that are which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Now, why does God do this? How do we know that this is not the same event? What, what, but why does God do this? Why does he have the sixth angel attached to the river Euphrates and the sixth plague attached to the river Euphrates? What is, what is God doing when he does this? Somebody has a good answer for that. Is he showing us a parallel? Can we say that they're parallel? There's something about using these symbols that they're parallel, but they're not the same. So, for instance, we know that there is a seven headed beast with 10 horns in Revelation 12. We know there's a seven headed beast with 10 horns in Revelation 13. 
And we know there's a seven-headed beast with ten horns in Revelation 17. Are they the same beast? They have some similarities, but are they the same? No. No, they're not. They're definitely not the same beast. One's a great red dragon. Uh, he has seven crowns on his seven heads. The one in Revelation 13, it's a composite beast. It has characteristics of the beasts of Revelation or Daniel chapter 7. And it has ten crowns on its ten horns. And, it, and it, it's not the same beast. It doesn't look the same. It has some characteristics that are the same. And then, of course, in Revelation 17, and, and we know the, the first one, pagan Rome, and the next one, pa- papal Rome. But in Revelation 17, you have a beast, but it's being ridden by a woman. It's actually committing fornication with the beast. And um, this beast in Revelation 17 doesn't have any crowns. And we know it's not, the beast itself is not papal Rome. The woman is papal Rome. She has the crown. Yes, I guess, in that sense, yeah. So to speak, right. yeah. Yeah, and and she sits upon the seven hills, well, which are, well, she has the seven heads, or what, what, what is it, the seven, yeah, seven heads. So the seven heads represent seven mountains upon which the woman sitteth. So those mountains are the hills of Rome, right? So it shows you that the woman is in Rome, it's the papacy, but it's committing fornication with this beast, which is not Rome. It, it's the world, right? That beast is the world. Where So we have one beast that represents seven heads and ten horns, represents pagan Rome. Another beast with seven heads and ten horns represents papal Rome. And another beast represents the world, the kingdoms of this world, that the woman is committing fornication with. And that woman is the papacy. It's a church, right? So, but but people will often think, well, because they have seven heads and ten horns, it's the same beast. That is, the heads must be the same heads on each of the beasts. And we've shown that that's not the case. And that the horns must be the same horns. But that's not the case. Now, there's symbolism in the horns, why there's ten. There's symbolism in the heads, why there's seven. But you wouldn't say that they're the same heads. And But that's what people tend to do. And, and so here with this symbol of Euphrates, uh, the Euphrates River, it symbolizes something. And it's used in the sixth trumpet and it's used in the sixth plague. But it's not really symbolizing the same thing. That is, it's not the same thing. It's the same symbol. But that symbol has to be applied and understood in the context of the vision itself. Right. So we can say, well, the drying up of the river Euphrates in the sixth plague is going to be when the papacy loses its support during those plagues. And and that's when Satan's personation of Christ will occur. The three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. This this event occurs because of the drying up of the river Euphrates. So this last ditch attempt of Satan to overthrow God's people who could be deceived if possible, which they can't, but he's going to try. So the, the, the idea of the river Euphrates here is going to be addressing judgments that occur upon Eastern Rome. Now we know that when we talk about these, these loosing of these, um, I just got to go to the first there, these angels that are loosed, or these angels that are going to, these angels are going to be loosed. We also know that there's going to be four winds that are loosed. So we, we can see that those are also going to relate to Islam, correct? At least in part. So these fourth, four angels that are loosed, which are bound in the great river Euphrates, this is going to be judgments upon Eastern Rome. And they're prepared for an hour, a day, and a month, and a year for to slay the third part of men. And so that's going to be Islam. And it talks about the number of the horsemen, um, and I'm not going to go into all of that. But the one thing I do want to to point out here is this idea, an hour, a day, and a month, and a year. Now, this is a way of specifying a time. That is, this prophecy here is saying that that this period of time is, is specific. 
Now, we often don't realize this about a date. So when we think in, in our minds today, we think about, okay, a date. Let's say we, you know, today's April 13th, 2024. It's hard to believe it's that far into the future, but it's April 14th, 13th, 2024. And right now it's, um, you know, seven minutes after 10. In specifying that time, what we are saying is that it's going to be, um, well, I would say, you know, it's the seventh minute the 10th hour, the 13th day, the fourth month, and the 224th year from some specific point. That is, it represents a span of time, correct? That yeah. is, I met from some point in the past, a certain number of years, a certain number of months, a certain number of days, and a certain number of hours and a certain number of minutes in order to say what time it is. So that is a span of time, is it not? I think somebody responded. I didn't catch them. I interrupted them. It's a span, right, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah. So, But we don't generally think of it that way. We think of it as just the point that is now, right? That's how we think of time. We think what time is it now? What is the date? What is the year? What is the month? Right? What is the time? But but in the way that we record that time, we measure it as a span of time from a certain point in history. Must be we're talking about prophecy too. When you're referring to prophecy, it's talking about seconds. Right. So if I'm talking about an hour, a day, a month, and a year, it is a specific date, right? That that's what's being told. And and we know that that date is August eleventh, eighteen forty. Right. That's that's what it's referring to. But it has to start somewhere in order to give you a date. Because I could talk about a span of time that's 391 years, but I need to have some place from which to count it. I can't give you what that date is. Uh, you know, if somebody says, well, tell me uh what date that is, you know, what time, what hour, what day, what month, what year, uh, well, uh, which calendar, which clock. Well, here in this context, we have been given the starting point. That starting point is with the first woe, when they have a king over them, Othman, right? There's a period of 150 years. And then we have a span of time from then. And now, now we don't describe it that way we don't say it's um what we do in a sense it's it's year 391 right then and uh it's going to be whatever month you would count that from you know you understand what i'm saying that it is referring to a specific date and what people often say is well this isn't talking about a span of time this is just talking about a date right but it doesn't give us the date but it does because it gives us the date in the description of what an hour, a day, and a month, and a year is, right? Hey, this is your starting point, folks. <laughs> yeah, but but and, and it's giving us by but it's giving us that date by understanding that an hour can be fifteen days, that a day can be a year, that a month can be thirty days, and that a year can be three hundred and sixty, and that this is the period of. The second woe. And we know when the second woe begins because it begins when the first woe ends. And so we could count that. And then we will come to a date on our calendar, which is the 840th year in the 11th day of the eighth, the eighth month, right? So August 11th, 1840, we can come to that date if we understand that this span of time has this symbolic component in the way that it's described. Now we have an hour, a day, a month, and a year. Now we know if we, we, we eliminate the hour and we just take the day and the month of the year, we get that 391 and a half, right? So that period of time that we looked at in a bit of detail last time. And that uh, we can see that we have 12 periods of, of 11,900 days and 1,100 and 90 minutes 
and that will make 391 years, and that these calendars will line up in this particular way. And that if we take a back tune, which is 144,000 days, and we compare it to 391 years, which is 142,810 days, so 144,000 days, and you see the difference, the difference is 1,190 days longer. So back tune is 1,190 days longer than 391 years, which is just very remarkable that we have all of these 11 nines in this prophecy. And, and so this means that this, this back tune, this period of 144,000 days, which we know relates to 144,000, and we know that July 18, 2020 relates to the Mayan calendar as a symbol. And this 391 years is also tied to it. We get this with all of these different symbols. We have them all tied together in our movement in in particular ways. Now, I'll show you this. So I've talked about this a bit, but it, it's, it's a little more interesting if you see it. So we know in 1969, February 11th, we were... We were blessed with the arrival of uh, Stephen Jameson into the world, right? So he's here. And uh, yeah, Stephen, we actually, uh, Dwight was not able to make it today because his mother is in the hospital. So I did uh, doing sort of two presentations. But, uh, but, but Stephen arrived into the world February 11th, 1969. And 32 years and seven months later, or 11,900 days later, 9-11 occurred. So I'll just make it a little bigger. Now, Stephen didn't notice this. For some reason, I noticed it. I don't know why he didn't notice, because uh, he knows about the 11,900 days as well. We also know that um, if you count from November 9th, I think I'm going to do this right. So if we went, uh, we put 2019 in here. I think this works. And you count 1190 days, you're going to come to Stephen's birthday. Now, um, in 2023. So if we counted from, uh, 11, nine in 2019, uh, we had come to, uh, Stephen's, uh, 54th birthday in 2023, right? February 11th, right? If we would have counted from, 11 9 in 1989, all right, November 9th, 1989. We would come to February 11th, 1993. So that would have been um, his uh, 24th birthday, right? 30 years difference. And so that means that, that Stephen's birthday attaches to 9 11 and 11 9 with the symbols that we have of 11,900 and 1,190, which, which is pretty remarkable. It, it doesn't. It it definitely isn't chance. It's not so, a can't be a coincidence. No, no, it's, it, it, no, it can't be. Uh, and now, Stephen is the one who just eleven hundred ninety minutes. What's that? There's too many things that. Yeah, yeah, there's too many things that that fit together. Now, in 1990, um, so back on October 13th, 2018. When I was doing that calculation of the 391 days, right? So I was doing this calculation. I, I knew it was the anniversary of my brother's uh, passing. Now, in, in 2018, how many years was it since my brother passed away on October 13th, 1990? So that's the day my brother David died. He was killed by a drunk driver. He had stopped his motorcycle. He had uh, just separated from his wife a couple of weeks before she separated from him. And, uh, she didn't want to live in a camper on a, on a work camp, uh, you know, with the two kids and him. And, uh, so, you know, he was married to my wife's sister. So Angela and Levine were sisters and me and my brother David were brothers and we married these two Van Wright girls. So, but he's, he's going to, it, it's this Saturday. I remember that Saturday specifically because I I, um, I went to the Spanish Adventist Church in Edmonton and ended up doing special music or something. I, I don't remember exactly what I did, but I didn't find out till the next day that my brother was killed by a drunk driver. So 
He was driving with my niece, who was five at the time, on his motorcycle. And uh, he had bought a seatbelt for the motorcycle that, that day, I believe. And he was coming back from uh, visiting a, uh, he was witnessing to a Catholic priest. And uh, anyway, she wanted, or he wanted a drink of milk or something, and he got off the motorcycle to get something out of the, the back of the motorcycle. And a drunk driver hit the motorcycle and him. And my niece was strapped to the motorcycle and she went flying with the motorcycle. She was bruised. And, and I talked to her last summer about it. She remembers it like it was yesterday. She didn't see her dad get hit or what happened to him because she was strapped to the motorcycle. And uh, the guy who uh, killed my brother, he was the same age. They're both 37. And uh, um, unfortunately, that guy committed suicide after he got out of prison for a year. So it's kind of a very sad story. But I remember my mom phoning me up uh, the next day, October 14th, to tell me my brother David was killed. So when we had that event, when I'm counting that 391 years and a half, a, you know, and a half of the day, 391 days and a half a day, right? Based on the 391 and a half years from the kings of Judah, that uh, I, I know it's October 13th. I know it's the anniversary of my brother's death. Now it's 38 years. That's two metonic cycles, right? You understand what I'm saying? So there's two metonic cycles there. So it's going to be, oh no, it's 20, 28 years, pardon me. So it's not two metonic cycles. It's 28 years later, right? It would be nice if it was 38, but it's 28 years. Uh, but the date above that on the biblical calendar is uh, the 23rd day of the seventh month. And that's a symbol, 723. We know it's early writing 74, where she talks about um, September 23rd. Now we know September is the ninth month, but it used to be the seventh month. And uh, 723 BC, there's lots of 723s that occur. Uh, and obviously September 23rd uh, is going to be 777 days before November 9th, 2019. And we also can see the symbol there in 723 of, of the message to the Levites. The 327 symbols are attached there as well. Okay. So there's, there's lots of symbolism in, in that. Now it's also the date that the Babylon falls in 539. So, so October 13th as, as a symbol had already occurred in my life and it, and it addresses a death. Right. In this case, the death of my brother. Now, my brother's wife, Angela, she passed away uh, last year. And um, that if we count from my brother's passing to the passing of his wife on May 13th, 2023, it's 11,900 days. So she passes away 11,900 days from the death of my brother. So her husband and and she never recovered from his death. It was uh, she wasn't she wasn't mentally well after he passed away. Um, that was just she wasn't really, really good at caring for herself or her children. Her children, uh, my, my, my nephew and niece, my nephew was 10 when my brother died. He lived with us for a while. Um, he lived with some other relatives and. Uh, just family friends raised uh, my niece. Uh, she wasn't able to raise her own kids. She did end up having another child with some guy and, and did raise him. But, uh, you know, it's a very, very tragic uh, story. But the fact that it was 11,900 days, I think, is significant. Now, it's also significant, significant because... If we subtract 777 days, that's March 27th, 2021, the symbol for the message to the Levites. Now, of course, this is something in my personal life, right? It relates to, to me. I mean, doesn't mean a lot to you. You didn't know my brother David. I mean, one of his paintings on the July 18, uh, 2020 study group, the, the main picture you see there of the guy on the camel, my brother painted that, that hangs in my living room. 
And I bought that picture from my brother back in uh, 1983 or something like that. You made a good picture for the web for the page. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That my 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 oldest son when he was a little kid called it Camel Man. You know. Um, but uh, yeah. So so anyway, this is something personal for me. But we can see that it fits in with our lines, and so. But the death of my brother and the death of my sister-in-law, they are symbols. They represent something. And, and we know a woman dying, a woman represents a church. right? We, we see in Ezekiel, so let's go there. So Ezekiel is going to as- address the destruction of Jerusalem. And, and this goes back to what we were talking about, that in nations and in our uh individual lives god has these purposes right there's these these purposes and i can't find it here but i'll come back to that spirit of prophecy statement god has purposes for nations and he has purposes for individuals and he marks these out with this these plummets these judgments these way marks that are on this line of of judgment so this righteousness this line of judgment we have this line of righteousness this way mark and this is on a line of judgment. And so God illustrates these things in our personal lives. And it, it, and so, you know, people could interpret this in different ways. What often people will do is they say, well, who are you? Why are you so important that your birthday is, you know, in part of this structure? Well, it's nothing to do with me being important. I'm definitely not a prophet. But I expect that all of us have things that God can witness to as symbols in our lives that can show that he is leading us and and often reproving and correcting us in the events that occur. And and these these events are important. The death of my brother David obviously is an important event for me spiritually. He's the one who led me to be a Christian. Both David and Angela, uh, well, Kelly Ross is the one that introduced Angela to my brother David. Um, He met her at a bookstore and she's looking at Bibles and we met her on a train and invited her over and you know, a week later, my brother proposed to her. So, uh, so you know, it ties together, you know, Kelly Ross and Adventism and uh, uh, all these different things that, that happened in my life that impacted me to be the person that I am. And every one of us has had these types of events happen. Things have happened in our lives where we can see God's hand and that these things have shaped us to understand the truths that we understand today. So um, uh, the thing I wanted to look at here was in Ezekiel. So let's go there. Now in the book of Ezekiel, we know that in chapter four, he's going to make this prophecy in the 391 years and the 40 years, and they're going to be fulfilled in Ezekiel 24, right? In the ninth year, in the 10th month, in the 10th day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, son of man, Write thee the name of this day, even this selfsame day. The king of Babylon has set himself against Jerusalem this selfsame day, right? This bone day, right? So he's marking this date. Now, the date is, as a symbol, is the 10th. Often, not always, but often the selfsame day is the 10th day. Not in some situations it is. And I think that, that the, this is the 10th day of the 10th month is a significant symbol um, but he's told to mark it, right? And remember, he's he's 500 miles away. He's not in Jerusalem. Uh, but he's told by God, the siege has begun this day, on the 10th day of the 10th month. And, and that is the case that can be testified in other places in scriptures that that's when it occurred. Now, we know that there's still going to be a year and a half of the siege until the walls of Jerusalem come down and then Jerusalem is destroyed right? And the temple, right? So it's, it, the walls are going to come down on the, or be breached on the ninth day of the fourth month. And then the, the temple is going to be destroyed on the 10th day of the fifth month. So it's another 10th day, another bone day. So then he's, he's going to talk about this siege, but then he's, he's given this prophecy. So also the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, behold, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with a stroke. Yet neither shalt thou mourn nor weep, neither shall 
thy tears run down. Forbear to cry, make no mourning for the dead, bind the tire of thine head upon thee, and put thy shoes upon thy feet, and cover not thy lips, and eat not the bread of men. So I spake unto the people in the morning, and at even my wife died. And I did in the morning as I was commanded. So here he has a, a tragedy occur, the death of his wife. And he's not to mourn her. And she becomes a symbol of the destruction of the temple that's going to happen, right? Because that's going to be an, an Jerusalem. But specifically, I think more of the temple. Um, in verse 21, it says, Speak unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the excellency of your strength, the desire of your eyes, and that which your soul pitieth, and your sons and your daughters, whom ye have left, shall fall by the sword. So the destruction... Oh, Aaron, what's that? I'll say Aaron wasn't to mourn his sons either. Yeah. Probably a different situation there. Yeah. But yeah, and this is here. So what's happening to Ezekiel is 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 symbolic. The death of his wife is symbolizing the destruction of the temple that's going to occur a year and a half later, right? So that's going to be the 391 years and a half, right, from uh, the beginning of the prophecy. So there's 391 years. He uses the prophecy of Josiah for the 390 years and the 40 years leading to this date. And then a year and a half later, the temple and the city are destroyed. God's, you know, the sons and the daughters are going to be, he'll fall by the sword. Now, another thing happens to him. And then he says, and your tire shall be upon your head, your shoes shall be upon your feet, right? You're not going to, you shall pine away for your iniquities and mourn one toward another, right? So you're supposed to, you're supposed to, from this experience, it's supposed to cause repentance, Thus, Ezekiel is unto you a sign. Well, Ezekiel, in in his actions of not mourning the death of his wife, and of course, his wife is part of him. That's part of the sign. According to all that he hath done, shall ye do. And when this cometh, ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, or the Lord God. Also, thou son of man, shall it not be in the day I take from them their strength, the joy of their glory, the desire of their eyes, and that whereupon their minds, they set their minds, their sons and their daughters, that he that escapeth in that day shall come unto thee to cause thee to hear with thine ears. And in that day shall thy mouth be open to him which is escaped, and thou shalt speak and be no more dumb, and thou shalt be a sign unto them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Now, this hymn being done, this is that Ezekiel is not giving a message regarding his people in this intervening time. So from the time that the siege begins until the escapee comes and reports to him that he saw the city destroyed, Ezekiel is, whether whether it's that he doesn't speak at all. I don't think that that's what it means. I, I think it means that he's not going to speak a word uh, regarding his people. Now, we know Ezekiel then is going to write chapter 25, and that's going to be Edom, Moab, Ammon, and Philistia, prophecies against them. And then chapter 26 and 27 are going to be a prophecy and a lament for Tyre. And then we're going to have uh, the prophecy dealing with the prince of Tyre and the king of Tyre. So there's a prophecy of the prince of Tyre, a lament over the king of Tyre. So you're going to have three chapters on Tyre. And then you're going to have uh, prophecies regarding Egypt. So the prophecy against Egypt, a lament for Egypt, and and then a prophecy about Pharaoh being slain, and then a lament over Pharaoh in Egypt. So you have four chapters for Egypt. So none of these are addressing God's people. In chapter 33, it says, Again, the word of the Lord come unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people. So here he is now no longer dumb. And say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for a watchman. So this is about the watchman. Ezekiel 3 is about the watchman. Ezekiel 33 is about the watchman. So this is the doubling of Ezekiel 3. 
So it's going to be, once again, that message that he's given in Ezekiel 3, he's going to be given in Ezekiel 33. And, and he's going to do this. He's going to begin speaking about his people. And then, um, and then it's going to say in verse 21, and it came to pass in the 12th year of our captivity in the 10th month, in the fifth day of the month. So remember, the temple's destroyed on the 10th day of the fifth month, but this is going to be the 10th month, the fifth day. That one that had escaped out of Jerusalem came unto me, saying, the city is smitten. Then he says, now the hand of the Lord was upon me in the evening before or afore he that escaped came and had opened my mouth until he came to me in the morning. And my mouth was opened and I was no more dumb. So he's saying my mouth was opened before he came, but it was said that his mouth is going to be open in the day that he comes. And I use this verse to illustrate to people who there are some people such as lunar Sabbatarians who argue that the day doesn't begin until morning and that it's only the day that you're not supposed to work. So they have their Sabbath only as the daytime, not the night. I I don't know if you know that about some lunar Sabbatarians. But anyway, we can see that it's in the day, but it's actually the evening before. So the day doesn't start in the morning. It starts in the evening, right? We can, we can see this clearly. So his mouth was open in the day that the escapee would come. So in the evening, his mouth is opened. He's not dumb anymore. But it's, it's not going to be until the morning that actually the escapee comes to him. So it's in the same day. So he would have known once his mouth was opened that the escapee is going to come that day. Right? So it's an interesting little detail. Now, um, but it tells us something as well. So one of the things that we need to recognize is that as a movement, we have been dumb, but our mouth has to be opened, right? And we're a person of unclean lips. Yeah, but, but yes, but remember, we, we don't do public evangelism, right? That there is a work that had to be done first for this movement. So the, the role of this movement was back in 2014. We're saying we're not doing public evangelism. And, and a lot of groups left the movement at that time. They said over that issue, right? They, they try to make it a righteous issue. Uh, so, you know, Jeff says we can't preach the gospel to people and that goes contrary to the spirit of prophecy. And that's not what was said, actually. Public evangelism, that means to bring numbers into our movement as if we are a church. That's not what we were to do. That wasn't the role of the movement. The movement was to actually give a message to Seventh-day Adventists. That's supposedly what it was supposed to be for. Um, that, that's the work that we were supposed to do. But really, it was an internal work. We just didn't realize that it was not just because uh, we have work to do to Adventists. We actually had a work to do for ourselves. You know, when when Paul was converted, he didn't become an evangelist right away. He had to learn. And this movement has to learn. And, and I believe we come to the point where we, we've had some events uh, occurring in this movement that shows that uh, another illustration that we have is a, di- a divorcement, right? So we have deaths symbolize something, but we also have a divorcement, right? And that's in um, Ezra chapter 10. So this is this is kind of the main part of the study. The other, the other all, everything's just been an introduction so far. Um, and in Ezra chapter ten, you're going to have uh, this. Um, where does it start? Yeah. So and the children. So they're going to have this divorcement from the strange wives, right? They meet on the twentieth day of the ninth month um, in 457 BC. I, I think actually technically it's. I'm trying to remember where the line changes from uh, 457 to 456. But definitely when you get the uh, first day of the 10th month in verse 16, that's going to be in uh, 476, right? So it's passed into January. Um, So they're going to have the divorcement. And the children of the captivity did so. So I, I guess if we start at verse 14, now, now let now our rulers of all the congregation stand. And let all them which have taken strange wives 
in in our cities come at appointed times and with them the elders of every city and the judges thereof until the fierce wrath of our God for this matter be turned from us. Only Jonathan, the son of Asahel and Jehaziah, the son of Tikva, were employed about this matter and Meshulam and Shabbatai, the Levite, helped them. And the children of the captivity did so. And Ezra, the priest, was certain of the chief of the fathers after the house of their fathers. And all of them by their names were separated and sat in the first day of the 10th month to examine the matter. And they made an end with all the men that had taken strange wives by the first day of the first month. So they take this period of of um, three months to rule on all of these marriages. And they're going to do it according to the law. That means that, that the wives have to be taken care of, right? They're not just casting them out uh, because that would really mean their death um, in, in many cases because a woman needs a, a husband to protect her and, and to care for her. So, so they're not just going to cast them off, but they are going to uh, separate or be divorced, right? So it's a divorce that occurs. So, so this idea of a divorce, we have understood that there is this symbol from the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month. I'm going to address it here. Now, we have done this, a little bit of this in our studies on Daniel chapter 11. And so I'm going to go to this slide here. Now, in Daniel chapter 11, we had looked at the Hebrew numbers in the phrase that talks about in those times. And, and we added them together. And we could count from 9-11, 8,248 days, to April 10th, 2024. So that was three days ago. So April 10th, 2024 was the first day of the first month. And it's uh, 2,187 days to April 5th, 2030, which is also the first day of the first month. So it's a period of six years um, on the biblical calendar. And um, so that... 2187th day, April 5th, 2030. We have the symbol of July 18, 2020. If you count backwards, you can see 7, 18, 2, right? Not exactly backwards because you're not going to, it's the seventh month, 81st day. You're going to go 18, but you're going to, and then you're going to take the two as representing the two for the 2020. Okay. So, so we had marked this out. Now, we, we also had connected this to the eclipse because if we took the other, my other Bible has for the Strong's number for the word those, it has H1990 and H99, H1990. Um, if we added that to the times and we counted from 9-11, it would bring us to the day of the eclipse. Now, what does the sun and moon represent? What do they symbolize? Yeah, or signs and seasons. Okay. So signs and seasons. Uh, what about in the story of Joseph in his dream? One of his dreams. What does the sun and moon represent? His mother and father. As mother and father, right? A husband and a wife. Okay. And and so you know the sun would re represent the husband. The wife is the moon. She reflects the glory of the husband. That type of idea as an illustration, right? And, and and so we can see that there's there's symbolism in there uh, of a husband and wife in an eclipse, right? Just that idea. Now we know it, of course, it also represents the sign, their signs uh, for the times of the seasons. And you know, I, we addressed a little bit about the eclipse. Why I didn't think it was a super significant as far as what the people out there in the world were expecting, but it does relate to our lines. And of course, April 8th means something to me personally. So again, it's something that personally means something. Um, and it is uh, my 11th wedding anniversary. Now, I mean, this is a difficult thing to talk about in, in a study, but uh, some people know that, you know, my wife is not well. She has some, some mental health problems and she's been gone for four months. And so it would be a very painful thing for me, obviously, with her not here on, on our 11th wedding anniversary. And her birthday was April 11th. So again, you know, to her not being here. And the year that we got married in 2013, the calendar was the same, at least 
from March 1st onward. So, you know, Easter fell on this, on March 31st back in 2013. And, and we got married in that period of time. Uh, so, so, you know, there was a lot of memories I was going through and, and of course been praying for her that she's going to recover. And, and I did mention, uh, when I was at, uh, the rec center yesterday, not yesterday, was it yesterday? Yeah, it was yesterday. I was talking with the lady at the counter and, uh, uh, she knows the place where my wife is and she knows the people, uh, there personally. She's been friends with them. And so she said, you know, she's in good care and should be cared for. So that was comforting. But the point is, you know, when I think about this, these symbols here in, in my own personal life, you know, the death of my brother, the death of my sister-in-law. And also we know, uh, in my first marriage, that, that that relates to these lines as well. Now, the main study that we were doing yesterday with uh, the brother from Hung, from, from Vietnam, was a study on this, the 3,291 days, right? So this is something that uh, we, we, I call the 777 chiasm. So we're all familiar with the 777 days on the right side on the bottom or at the top, I guess, too, from November 9th, uh, 2019 to December 25th, 2021. And in relation to the Mayan calendar, this is the date that Heidi and I first met. Well, at least officially. I mean, I know she... I've seen her in the past because she was a Seventh-day Adventist. I'd seen her at camp meetings. She saw me playing guitar, stopped and listened to me probably when she was a teenager. But we met, you know, officially introduced at a Bible study that I was giving on the 2520 on December 21st, 2012. And that was the day that the Mayan calendar moved to that 13000, which is... 1,872,000 1,872,000 days from the start of the Mayan calendar. So we did that study last week. And there's 777 days to my 52nd birthday and, and 52 solar years. Obviously, my 52nd birthday is um, compared to the from 52 prophetic years. The difference is 273 days. So you can see up here in the top. That, um, whoops, you can see there, um, here's December 21, 2012. I meet my, my new wife, but we're going to get married April, April 11th. That's going to be 108 days after we meet. And then she's going to turn 34 on April 11th in 2013. Um, but you can see the 777 days to my 52nd birthday. And you can see that if I go from my birth, 18,720 days, it brings me to May 9th. Now, that would have been my 33rd wedding anniversary with my first wife. But she was engaged to be married prior to me even meeting Heidi. And uh, so anyway, that we have this, this anniversary date from my first marriage. And we notice that May 9 is also April 26th on the Julian calendar. But then there's 273 days to when I turn 52. And that structure... We already had in uh, this period of time. So there's 504 days. Uh, I don't have it shown here. Where is it? Uh, I think I have it down in this. No, I don't. I don't have it drawn on this chart. But we know that there is from March 27th, 2021 to December 21st, 2021. There's 273 days. March 7th represents 273. And there's 504 days. That's 252 times two from November 9th, 2019 to March 27th, 2021. Here at March 27th, 2020 on this chart, because that was addressing 2,730 days. But anyway, another symbol of 273. Uh, so we have this chiasm. And, and it was this chiasm that I sent to Jeff on April 26th, 2020. Showing that one is there is a failed prediction, uh, regarding, you know, the end of the world. It didn't end on December 21st, 2012. My world began. I met Heidi. And then 777 days later, I turned 52. 
And then there's this other date, March 27th, 2017. Now, I didn't put it in here, but this date on the biblical calendar is the 25th day of the 12th month. So it symbolizes December 25th, right? Now, we know on this side, uh, December 25th, 2021 is the end of this 777 days. And then we have this September 23rd, 2017 where I present July 18, 2020 as a symbol of the prediction before midnight that this movement was trying to understand about a prediction that we are going to make, and that's 777 days before November 9th, 2019. So there was all of these things. Here I even have some stuff dealing with the solar eclipse in 2017 in here. So there's a lot of, a lot of symbols in here. Now, where, you know, the reason why I, the study that we did yesterday, so I wasn't, I was just answering this question regarding the 3,291 days because he wanted it, it was in our study dealing with uh, the book of Judges, right? So that was this study here. That's that's what he asked about because that's what we've been going through the Telford Muse um, studies, and and so we addressed this the 3,291 days and when the two lines of Jotham are joined. So this is, I'm not going to go into all that. It completes uh, 3,291 days of the 7-7 chiasm. Uh, the bramble is uh, 329, which relates to the 329 days from October 13th. So we get back to that October 13th date, 2018 to September 7th, 2019, which holds March 27, 2019 as its center date. Uh, the Levitical chiasm was the template for the 777 chiasm. March 27, 21 is 777 days prior to May 13th, 2013, which is 504 days uh, from December 25th, 2021. And this date completes a chiasm with July 18 as its center. While it may not mean much to others, it is the date of my sister-in-law Angela's death which was 11,900 days, 32 years and seven months from the death of her husband, my brother, David Lynn Turner, on October 13th, 1990. Remember that 391 years is 12 periods of 11,900 days and 1,190 minutes. 11,900 days, 1,190 minutes times 12 is 142,810 days for 391 solar years and is 1,190 days shorter than 144,000 days. The two periods of 1,200 a uh, 1,029 days for each side of the chiasm are 47 weeks or th three times 49 weeks each. And and this is this picture. How do I turn this to the right? There must be a way rotate um, size and position. So I got to rotate this somehow. There it is. Is there just some way I could rotate the whole screen around? Just like the whole, instead of doing it like this, is there some way that I could just get this? I know I can with a PDF. You see that little um, round thing on the left there? Well, I can do this. That just changes the picture, but then it, you know, it doesn't really, well, I guess I could do this. I'll just go uh, uh, view. Uh, that's not view, it'd be layout. Orientation. Yes, I could do it that way. Okay, so we can see the whole the whole picture now. And and so what we have is in 2013. For some reason, I don't have the date there. I don't know why that date got didn't get included. So there should be a date there in 2013 that I marked. So I'll do it this way. There it is. So that's going to be from the Mayan calendar. So that's just showing you what we have here. Okay, so that's going to be the December 21st, 2012. And you can see that what we have is the seven years to November 9th, and then the 777 days, right? So there you just see this. And, and this is going to relate to all these different dates in 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18. Uh, this is going to address here uh, the olive, the fig, the vine, uh, lots of lots of different things. The point is that that's what we were looking at. Now, in in doing that, I came to this conclusion that um, 
This is kind of what I'm wanting to show you here. So we, we addressed all of these symbols. But when we come to this, the question is, what does April 10th, 2024 represent? Can we say that the divorce has been completed? It was done according to the law. But there's this divorcement between who? We, we said that it has to do with this movement to divorce from its strange wives. I don't remember what Mark said. Well, it's going to be the end of Collins. Um, it wouldn't be strange doctrines, would it? Yeah, but it's going to be connected to Collins' symbol. So that, right? So we had 880 or 88 months from, um, from Collins, the end of Collins' prediction to April 5th, 2030, which is the first day of the first month. And we said that's the period of time that's given to us. Would they call it strange teachings? Yeah, yeah. Well, the strange ones. Yeah, it's the wrong method of study, oh. right? And and we also connected it to um, December December twenty fifth, uh, twenty twenty one or twenty. Yeah, what was the date? Staying on yeah. So we connected it to uh, twenty twenty two. December 25th, 2022, right? So there was this invitation made. And that's going to be on the first day of the 10th month, right? Literally, yes. So Iran is referencing the idea that uh, Jeff Pippinger's to cut off anyone who disagrees, it appears to be consistent. And that's what I'm saying is that, that the movement itself has chosen to divorce from this message. So this divorcement is not something that we wanted. We did everything that we could. And, and this is where some personal things come in because in, in my first, it, yeah. So in my Divorce first, number, what's that? Go ahead. So in my first, I just marriage, say divorce, divorce or Miller's rules. Okay. Divorce from Miller's rules. Right. So, so in my first marriage, I, I was divorced. Now, I don't believe in divorce. I never pursued a divorce. I did everything to try to stop from being divorced, but there was nothing I could do about it. It, it was it was something that was beyond my control, and, and I got divorced in in 2011. Separated in uh, 2004. For uh, 2004, got separated and divorced in 2011. Uh, about seven years later. But I sought everything I could do to restore that marriage. I didn't sign divorce papers. I never filed anything, you know, like a se separation agreement or anything like that. And sometimes that happens. There's there's a person who just does not want to be married to you anymore. And and with my first wife, she's a wonderful person. She just didn't want to be an Adventist anymore. And she knew how much I was an Adventist and being married to me. She had to, you know, make a decision, and her decision was to end the marriage. So, you know, it, it's a very personal thing, and and my goal was never to be remarried. I, I I'm not really a fan of people just getting divorced and getting remarried. Um, and so the circumstances regarding me getting remarried, again, not something I was looking for. Um, but Heidi had no one to care for her, and uh, so. Um, you know, God definitely demonstrated that I was to marry her and it was in his providence. And we can see it's a part of these lines, but a divorce has occurred. And, and for me personally, there's been a separation in this second marriage and I hope it doesn't lead to divorce. I hope Heidi heals and gets better and comes back. Um, but it's not something I have control over. And, and I do believe that. Just because there is a divorce in this movement, it doesn't mean that individuals uh, are not going to come back to the truth. You know, this is not a judgment or a criticism of any person. It's just the reality that uh, is being illustrated in these stories. And, you know, the death of my brother, the death of my sister-in-law, the symbolism there, and the births. Right. You know, th those things are are important symbols. My, my third son, Micah, was born April 19th, 1985. 
And the next day we had the first upper room Bible study. And, and you know, that April 19th date, you know, kind of sticks in my mind a little bit. It's familiar. But, you know, all of us have experiences. And, and I'm, I'm trying to find this quote here again that I had. So this was, again, this was taken from Maranatha, the May 24th date that you would read this. And, um, you know, the history of nations that one after another have occupied their allotted time and place and consciously witnessing to the truth of which they themselves knew not the meaning speak to us, speaks to us, right? So we know that, that God is working in spite of the fact that people are aware of it. And this is true of nations. To every nation and to every individual of today, God has assigned a place in his great plan. He has a place for each one of us. Today, men and nations are being measured by the plummet in the hand of him who makes no mistake. All are by their own choice deciding their destiny. And God is overruling all for the accomplishment of his purposes. All that prophecy has foretold is coming to pass. Until the present time, all that prophecy has foretold is coming to pass until the present time. It has been traced in the, on the pages of history. And we may be assured that all which is yet to come will be fulfilled in its order. It's written on a line. It's measured by the plummet. These way marks of righteousness. And this prophecy in Revelation 9. It speaks to this movement, it speaks to nations, and it speaks to us as individuals. And it's something that we, we really need to, to recognize, is that this is not some game that we are playing with numbers and dates, that we are actually watching the hand of God working in our lives in the past and in the present, showing that we are part of his purposes and plans. And that we have a work to do. Maybe the escapee hasn't come and returned from the destruction of Jerusalem yet. But I do believe that we need to begin to speak. And that God is laying before us a work that we have to do. The divorcement has happened, I believe. And yet we have a work to do. And, and it's something that God's going to be leading us in, in the future, this year, showing us this. And we also had, uh, you know, some other stuff dealing with uh, Daniel 11, verse 36, which is 82,499 days, or the lexical number is. And and we, we also had um, that. So I'm just going to show you this really quickly. Yeah. How did I do that? I can't find it right now. Anyway, I'm not going to worry about it. So because we're running late. So thanks, everyone, for this study. Think about these things. Think about how God has led in the past and what he's doing in your life and what he's calling you to do in the present to make a choice. And that choice is going to decide your destiny. So let's close with prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your word, for your comfort, and we pray for one another. Lord, you know the struggles and the trials that we face, the people we care for and uh, their trials. We pray for Dwight and his mom, the trial that uh, they are facing. And we pray for our loved ones. I pray for my wife, Heidi, that you can bless her, that your angels can watch over her, and that you can continue to uh, bring people into her life that will help her uh, to heal from this setback. And I pray for each person who's watching these videos and that participates and that's searching for truth, that you can care for them, that they can know that you care for them. Uh, I pray for my guitar student and I pray for the people that are going to be coming tomorrow that I'll be witnessing to. And I just ask, Lord, that you can help each one of us as we minister to those around us, that we can be ministered to by your spirit by obeying your voice. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.